Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Two Footer Tackle Podcast. I'm your host, Iris Matakos. We're here again. Episode, what is it? I've got the run sheet up in front of me. Episode 8. Episode 8 of Season 2. So um, we're heading into, we're, we're fully into the Premier League season now and the football season in particular. First international break done and dusted. So we're going to, yeah, we're the back end of that. That's it behind us, which is good. But I hope everyone's well, as always. I hope everyone's week has, um, has treated them nicely. Uh, mine was great. Um, my AFL team, my Australian rules football team, for those who are uh, watching overseas or for those who are unaware, uh, we don't care about footy if you're Australian, um, the Carn Football Club are through to the preliminary final, which is the second round before the grand final, which is the big final. Um, the first time they've been there since 2000. And for those who are uh, uninitiated, I was born in 2004. So... It's been a while. Um, and for those who don't know about the AFL final structure, essentially, it's like the playoffs, but for some reason, we call the semi-final the th- the third the, the the second game of the four. It's really weird. So we have the qualifying slash elimination finals, depending on where you finish. Then you have the semi-finals. Then you have the preliminary finals. Then you have the grand final, which is the for the game. If, if you win that game, you get the trophy and you're the best. Um Carlton have not won the grand final since 1995. Um, they've not made a grand final since 1999, and they've not made a preliminary final since 2000. So it's been a while, and um, we're, we're, we're there now, and I will be travelling up to Brisbane to watch that game. So um, I'll get back on Monday morning. So you might get a really happy and enthusiastic podcast host next week or you might get a really depressed one and it's got nothing to do with football which is great but anyways that's me digressing hope everyone is well as always hope the week has treated you all very nicely hope your your team's won in all sports um unless you're a melbourne demon supporter then <laughs> unlucky um but yeah other than that the the sun's out in melbourne the weather is divine unfortunately with the sun comes the hay fever and no amount of zyrtec can stop this whole being allergic to grass situation. So it's really something that it's very much a me problem. And how how much of a piss am I that I'm allergic to grass? Um, so yeah, I am currently battling the the effects of crippling hay fever. But we move, and I've just realised that the messy poster behind me is slightly off. So I'm going to pause the recording and fix that before it falls off. Turns out it wasn't just the messy one; it was the Maradona one as well. So hopefully. Um, all of those are fixed. Obviously, for those listening on audio, this like affects you at all, doesn't affect you at all. Um, but I really, I, I really don't want a, a mean Jane Oakle and um situation. And for those who know, you know. But I'm digressing. It's three minutes into the podcast, and we haven't mentioned fuck all about football. So I guess this is typical me and typical this podcast. As that, I really need to fix the focus on the camera because I think the I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. The fact that I have faces in the background. And I've got the camera set to recognizing faces, and it's just a whole, it's just a whole mess. Anyways, let's touch on football, shall we? Um, what do we speak about? Obviously, the Premier League's back. I want to speak on United, as as is the title. Um, I want to speak on United, not brief, not extensively, but not briefly either. I want to I want to delve deep into their issues because it's it's deep. So there's that Spurs just keep on keeping on. Do we have the have um have we developed or have we found Manchester Manchester City's newest star in Jeremy Doku um we've touched on him stories of the season so far which I don't actually have any stories of the season I just want to kind of just want to chat about some potential storylines some potential things that could happen um that that have happened and could potentially come to the full race in the coming weeks um so let's start with Manchester United um this this football club is certainly something. Um, the yeah, this football club is certainly something. Manchester United uh, lost three 0 to three one to Brighton at home, and that's not really the story I want to speak about because the the United haven't started the season well. What what is there? 
what is their kind of what's their record? It's not great. I know it's not great. They lost three one over the weekend um, to to Brighton at home, which isn't the worst result considering how good Brighton have been. But they've won two games this season. One was a one nil win at home to Wolves, to Wolves in which they weren't convincing, and the other one was a three two win at home to Forest in which they went two nil down inside five minutes. They looked they looked fine in that Forest game. I think the two goals were just. Something that happened in football. I don't think those two goals were something to be concerned about. They haven't won away, a game away from home. They haven't come within two goals of a team away from home. Um, and both of their wins have come by one goal margins. I say away from home in all three of their losses because obviously the game on the weekend was at home. Um, and they versus Bayern Munich in the Champions League on the week, uh, on Thursday morning. Obviously, Ten Hag has been put under the spotlight about what what's going on with him and the whole... Is he, um, like, what's going on with him? Is he the right man for the job? Should he leave? Should he get sacked? Will he get sacked? And obviously, the whole situation with Sancho, Anthony, and Mason Greenwood have really killed his kind of squad depth. I think the Greenwood one we can toss aside because that's been happening for a while. But the Anthony one and the Sancho one have been massive, yeah, massive kind of... In, like a massively influenced and have been massively massively influential in in United's downfall. I want to say or poor starts of the season. Obviously, neither Sancho nor Anthony were involved in the match day squad. Their winger options included Garnacho, Palestri, and that's about it. If you want to, if you want to really include both of them, they're both really young and very raw. So it'd be very harsh to put your whole club's hopes on them. Um, they played obviously Rashford of course he's probably their best winger at the time, but they almost played him as a, as a central striker with Hoyland. Um, yeah. So from a lineups perspective and from a team perspective, it's really it's really concerning. Um, I was I was posed this question. I say I was posed this question. I was having a conversation. I was I was having a conversation and I was. The conversation topic was which starting eleven would you prefer, Manchester United's or Brighton's? And I mean, if we look at personnel wise, probably Bright- probably United's in terms. Of if you go player by player, you probably take Onana over Steele. Steele's very good, but probably Onana, you probably do take him just based on the credits and the bank he's got. That back four, you probably split the midfield two slash three. You probably split, maybe give it three two to United, and then that front line, you probably give two to United and then one to um. One to Brighton, obviously, being the Toma, who's a freak. Didn't play that well the weekend, but he's still very good. But regardless, as a team, the the gap and the this and the distance between Brighton and United as a football team is staggering. Like it's staggering. I watched that game. That was the game that was was the main game on Goal Rush, which the fact that English people don't have a Goal Rush is insane. Um, but for those who know, you know. He, that was the main game on Goal Rush, and I was watching that game in almost in awe about how just good Brighton were. Um, probably not how good Brighton were in specifically related to Brighton, but also but mainly in comparison to United. It was just like wow, Brighton are just killing United, like especially in possession. The amount of, they created so many, they created far better or far more big chances, playing out wide and using the channels. Um, it was a it was a far more convincing and um, what's the word I'm looking for? A far more convincing and clinical game from Brighton, away from home at Old Trafford. It was insane, insane to think about. And I think this 90 minutes almost was a microcosm of a bigger problem at United, like a far bigger problem that that is currently plaguing Old Trafford and, and obviously the whole club, right? It starts from the top, and I speak to United fans, and of course the fish rots from the head, the phrase that I haven't stopped hearing for the past seven months when it comes to United. Um... But where do you start? Where do you start? Because there's a couple of factors that, yes, United have been kind of at fault with and haven't, if that makes sense. So obviously the factors that they aren't in control of, the Anthony situation, wait, it's it's a very, very much right now a wait and see. I'm not going to comment. I spoke about it briefly, just outlining what happened. I'm not going to comment on it yet because it's a very much a wait and see. The Greenwood situation out of their control and their two players, regardless of the fact that Mason Greenwood is a fuckwit and a prick and a C-U-N-T, um, he, he, the, the, that whole incident is out of United's control and they did their due, due diligence, probably in a very lax way, but they eventually they reached, as things stand, they reached a correct outcome in which he doesn't play for Manchester United at the current moment, which is great. 
Yes, it's on a loan, and yes, we, we might not know what, what happened in the future, but as things stand, he's not playing for United. Good result. Out of their control, but that's the best result. Anthony, once again, not playing for United at the moment, but once again, I appreciate United doing their due diligence and taking this seriously, removing it from the team, removing from the spotlight and all the media scrutiny and allowing the case to be done lawfully. Sick. Awesome. Great. That's two situations out of their control. Now, let's look at the Jaden Sancho case. Jaden Sancho obviously started, like, obviously was well known to be a youth academy product at Manchester City. Went to Germany for a fresh start and started killing it for Borussia Dortmund, right? As a lot of younger players have. And that club seems to be a breeding ground for a lot of younger players who can, who, who can really thrive under that, under the atmosphere at that club, right? He went to United for £100 million and didn't really hit the ground running. But I think a lot of people, you, 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 you give players time. Right, you give players some, especially Sancho. Yes, despite the price tag that was put on him, he's still a very young player, right? So you can't, you can't expect him, especially at such a young age, to just come in and go bang, right? And just start having twenty-five goal contributions in in a season, right? Despite the price tag, so we gave him a season. Well, I think we're now in the, in his third season. I think are we in his, are we, we're in his third season, aren't we? Um, let me just double check. We're definitely in at least his second, right? Um, it's I'm pretty sure it's his third. End of 21, yeah. So 21, 22, 22, 23, 20, yeah. So we're, we're in his third season right now. I don't... And obviously he's been exiled from the squad because of disciplinary issues, training issues. Ten Hag has been very vocal about Sancho. Sancho has been very vocal back. There seems to be a massive disconnect between both parties. This is one of those things where it's almost a I want to say sliding doors moment because I don't think Jaden Sancho is the is the guy to fix United's problems. Even if you put United in that team on the weekend, I still think they lose, right? Just based on how they've played. But it I think I think it resemble it resembles symbolizes quite a lot about the state of that club. I was very pro Ten Hag, right, and I have been very vocal about my. Uh, appreciation, I guess, for Eric Ten Hag and his managerial acumen and his ability to transform a club. We also already did at Ajax, and we've seen his ability to take players and transform them and to create a very good, fluid system and really galvanise a club. I think he's been very unlucky with how well Ange Postacoglu has been doing at Spurs, and we'll touch on Ange a little bit later on, probably in a, in a, far, in a completely separate point. But when you look at what Ange has done at, at, you know, at um, Spurs... When you look at what Arteta was able to do last season at Arsenal, granted that was this was Ten Hag's first season last year, and it was Arteta's would have been what fourth year I think last year. So it's apples and oranges to a certain extent, of course, right? But still, you're seeing these clubs under new managers get be, like have their club completely galvanised. Obviously, what Eddie Howe's done at Newcastle, having clubs completely galvanised and have such a transformation in feelings, energy, vibe. Etc. Etc. And of course, naturally, on-field performance. United last year, in my opinion, did exactly what they were going to do. I had them finishing what they finished third or fourth last year. Um, but they did exactly what they what I had in mind for them. Um, let me just double check actually, because that's actually quite poor from me. I should remember they finished third. They finished third comfortably in the top four, but not really challenging for the title, which is where I had them. I had them finishing fourth or third. In my mind, potentially slipping to fifth if results didn't fall their way. But the overall theme of the season for them was going to be they were going to be fine. They were going to just naturally progress. They might lose some games they shouldn't. They'll win some games they shouldn't. They'll lose some games that games they shouldn't. They win. They'll win some games they should. And that's what happened, right? They went. They won a trophy, I think. They they did win the Community Shield, I think. So it's one of those things where it's like, in my opinion, we saw a perfectly linear progression for Manchester United last season. And I think you have to praise Eric Ten Hag a lot for last season because of all the turmoil that was around the club, obviously, with the owners, with Ronaldo, with Greenwood, a lot of turmoil, turmoil, a lot, right? And he still managed to get top four, and they won a trophy. I'm almost certain they won a trophy. Um, it was the Community Shield. No, it wasn't. It was the Carabao Cup, right? Yeah, they beat Newcastle. Because Carriers was in goal. Yeah. Um, for that game. That's the storyline I remember for some reason. Um, so, yeah. I think you have to kind of appreciate Ten Hag's performance last season. And it was a perfectly linear kind of... It, it was a perfectly linear progression. 
However, football and sport isn't linear. Progression is never linear. There are peaks and troughs, and there are times where you are progressing really well, and then you just fall, and then bang, you bounce back up, right? How many times have you seen that in sport, uh, where teams go up, crash down, and then they're back up, or they crash down, and they're back up for a year, and then they crash back down? F- football and sport is never linear. So I think the, the, uh, the fact that so many people are jumping to conclusions about United start to this season, a little bit concerning. Considering the signings that they haven't got, I should say. They've still got McTominay in that midfield, which is unbelievable. Yes, they signed him out, who I'm assuming is injured considering he didn't play. Um, Hoyland, I think, will be a good signing. I think I spoke about him last week or the week before. I think he's going to be a fine signing. I think he was quite good. Um, I think he's been quite good early on in the season. He just hasn't been able to find that rhythm, which, considering the dysfunctional nature of United United's team right now, you can't really blame him, right, for not for not firing. Um so there's those two. There's like there's those two players, obviously, and then obviously uh, who else? Who else? Yeah, who else? Yeah. Um, Varane's out. They signed Amrabat, who I think will be a good signing for them. So they they've getting they'll get players back. They'll get structure back. They'll get continuity back. And I think eventually, I I back Ten Hag in. I do. I still back Ten Hag in. I think they're gonna get it right on the pitch. Bring Amrabat in. Bring Mount back in, bring Varane back in, get Hoyland up and running, get some more games into Garnacho and Palestri because you're going to need to, considering they have fuck all wingers because of what's happened. Obviously, Anthony and Greenwood are out of the control. Sancho, a little bit more of a tangible and a little bit more of a controllable case. So I think on the field, they'll eventually get it right. I think they will. I'm not going to jump to conclusions yet. I don't actually can't remember where I had them in my pre-season predictions. I think I did have them, have them in the top four. But... I don't think I don't think we should be jumping to conclusions about sack Ten Hag, should Ten Hag leave, etc. Well, maybe not that second point. Should Ten Hag leave? Eric Ten Hag is a... Obviously, this question has been posed and been thrown around constantly, right, throughout the football kind of media, in a sense, landscape, right? I don't know necessarily about... I don't know necessarily about about kind of Ten Hag, what he can offer in terms of, I don't know, maybe not what he can offer, but how he will respond to this kind of criticism. Because at Ajax, there wasn't a lot of criticism, right? That's probably the one flaw that, flaw or kind of um, question mark. How will Eric Ten Hag respond to criticism? This is the first time probably in his managerial career, especially at United, that he's under major criticism. Performances aren't good. Off-field dramas are front and centre. The board's a mess. The fans are angry. He's making bad decisions. Obviously, we all saw the reception when Hoyland got booed off, right? So I think Ten Hag... It's, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a really interesting talking point, a really interesting thing to see what will develop of it because I don't think Eric Ten Hag should leave. I want to get that clear, right? I don't, I, I don't think Eric Ten Hag should leave. I think Eric Ten Hag, like I said, he will eventually get it right. Once he gets those players back, like Mount, Amrabat, Varane, once he gets those players back, hopefully Sancho gets introduced back into the squad very soon. I think on the field, they'll get it right. I back Ten Hag, and I think the players are good enough to keep them at a very, very respectable level. Right? However, however, what I do worry about is all of the off-field stuff. The board the fans, the overall turmoil surrounding that club right now, I don't know if he will be able to overcome that. Could it, I, will he succumb under pressure? I don't know. But I think, I think genuinely it could get to the point where he breaks, just completely breaks, as I fix the camera focus, and just basically, I wouldn't say quits, but stops. And stops maybe performing at his level and starts to let the pressure get to him and starts to crumble because it's intense. All the off-field stuff, the fans are angry, the board are unhappy, the board want to sell the club, the fans want the board to sell the club, but the board aren't selling for a reasonable price, yet the board aren't investing, so the fans aren't happy, and the fans aren't happy at Ten Hag because he's not getting the best out of very mediocre players like Scott McTominay. It, it, it creates a, a shitstorm. It creates a shitstorm that could just burst. Does Ten Hag have the... Charisma to deal with that? Who knows? Does Ten Hag have the cojones to deal with that? Who knows? 
What I do know is that on the field, he'll get it right. Once he, get, once he gets his players back, the performances will start to, to, incre- to get better. But if the fans are continuing to battle against the board, the board are continuing to battle against the fans, and the board's going to battle against Ten Hag, Ten Hag's going to battle against the board, as well as other players like Sancho and others, potentially, I, that's, that's my worry. That is my worry for United. Not the on-field stuff. Because the squad's too talented, right? Once once he gets his players back, the squad's too talented, and the squad's too talented, and Ten Hag's too good of a manager, far too good of a manager for him to just basically be like, no, uh, I just can't figure this out, and you for United to crumble. It's yeah, it's really it's going to be a really tricky situation, um, and I guess we'll just have to wait and see. It's one of those things where it's a kind of wait and see, see what develops kind of thing because. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's really interesting. Really interesting. I guess that's. I guess that's a natural end to that kind of thing. Um, anything else to speak on? They've obviously got. I mean, that game against Bayern will be fucked. Like that game against Bayern will be. That could be bad. Like Bayern have a relatively um, full strength team. Who did they play in their draw against Leverkusen? Um, Leverkusen, by the way, top of the table, undefeated. Javi Alonso's man, mate. That's um. That's saying keep, keep an eye on, keep an eye on Leverkusen because they've got some pretty good players. Obviously, Verts, um, Florian Verts is a baller, right? Um, twenty years old and he's playing at a stupidly good level. Jacques is in that midfield, which is quite interesting as well. Um, but yeah, let's uh, back on track. Um, Bayern Munich have a relatively full strength team. I don't really think there's many major outs. Neuer didn't start the game against Leverkusen, but like it's not like a major out. That midfield three that they've got of Kimmich, Goretzka, Muller, Dangerous, Nabri, Sane, Kane, Upamecano, Kim Min Jae, Davies, and Lima. <sighs> Boy, like that could be dangerous. Um, yeah, I worry. I worry. It's at the Alliance as well. So that could be a real kind of, a real, real weird area where United could rock up put out the performance of their lifetime and get their season back on track, in which, great. Or they could rock up and do an Arsenal and get battered 5-1, 5-0, 4-0, and then it's pressure, pressure, because United don't get smacked 4-0 at the Allianz. That doesn't happen. So I guess pressure on Ten Hag, because (laughs) pressure on Ten Hag, I guess. Um... Let's move on. Natural natural segue. Not really a natural segue, but a segue nonetheless, as my nose is playing up again, which is just awesome. Let's speak about Spurs. Um, let's let's speak about Tottenham Hotspur, shall we? They just keep on keeping on, hey? They just keep on keeping on. The, yeah. <sighs> they just... Ah, uh, look, look. I'm not going to sit here and say I told you so, but I told you so. Um... And I said this last week, I said it the week before, what? What of it, right? I'm going to sit here and say, I say it because I kept saying it and a lot of people were questioning his acumen and I thought, and I said, just wait, just wait, you'll fall in love. And I think top, not only to have Tottenham fans fallen in love, the football community have fallen in love because Ange Postacoglu has this really uncanny ability to speak like a normal human being. It's weird, right? I know, right? It's insane. Tottenham fans have gone through the last three managers of Conte, Mourinho, and Nuno, three robots, three egomaniacal robots who think the whole world revolves around them, right? Nuno to a lesser extent, but still quite real if you want to use it in this scenario. So when you bring in a manager who has come from, who's Greek-Australian, who has managed in about four different countries at seven different levels won so many trophies he can't even count and will still sit there and say all the right things and speak like a normal human, I can see why Spurs fans are warming to him, right? I can see why they are. And and it's something that if you had followed his journey, like I have quite closely for obvious reasons, and I don't blame you if you haven't. I'm not going to sit here and say, you can't comment on Ange unless you didn't watch his games managing Yokohama in the Japanese league, right? I followed him because... Yeah, I'll lose my idol, right? But he, this is something that we all know, for those who've watched him and for those who've followed him. And this is something that we aren't shocked by because 
he's just the best. Like, like the limbs when Kulisevsky scored that winner on the weekend against Sheffield United to put them 2-1 up in the 100th minute, those limbs are, are otherworldly, right? And it's own If you replace Ed Postecoglou with Antonio Conte, those limbs aren't the same. Guarantee you those limbs aren't the same, right? Because... There was this always overriding feeling about Antonio Conte that the football's boring, he's going to get us a trophy, but then he's going to leave. He's going to get pissed off with the board, he's going to leave. He thinks he's better than us, and he thinks he thinks that we're below him. Whereas Ange, it's the complete opposite. Ange looks up to the club, right? He does not think... He, he doesn't have a divine right to be there. Conte thought that he did. Jose thought that he did. Nuno, maybe a little bit different. Maybe Nuno just sucks. There's a massive difference in character. Massive difference in character. And look, I went on I went on the We Are Tottenham TV live stream pre-season, right? Shout, shout out to the lads. It was, a, it was an honour being on there. Um, and I said, I was like, you will fall in love with him. You will guarantee you, you will fall in love with him, right? Because he's this captivating person. Ca- absolutely captivating. The way that they're playing with really a... Not their best squad ever, right? The, 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 their team on paper is quite, I want to say poor, but like, I'm about to sneeze, pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. You know that thing where you say, if you say pineapple, you don't sneeze. It's weird, but it works. Um, their squad on paper is not great, right? It's not, oh my God, look at how good Spurs are. Sun up front, real easy a striker, probably not. Not a pure number nine, but he's playing there and doing a job as captain. Kulisevsky, Madison, Solomon. Kulisevsky was a fringe player at Juventus. Madison got relegated with Leicester, and Solomon was at Fulham last year, right? But for those who know, Manuel Solomon is a pretty good, pretty good footballer, especially if you play football manager. Um, you got pa- you got Papa Sar, who was at um, who was at Mites on loan, and last year you got Basuma, who was a who was awful last year, right? Awful, despite being very good the year before. Last year was awful. Pedro Porro similarly came from the Portuguese league and was not great. Christian Romero was probably pretty good last season, arguably their best player on paper. Probably with actually with Sun, probably their top two best players on paper. Van der Ven, who I didn't know of before they signed before Tottenham signed him from Wolfsburg. This left back who I'm not even gonna pretend to know how to pronounce, and I'm not gonna try to because it will I'm just not going to, who came from Italy. And Visario, who has come from Empoli. Like, it, it's it's a on paper. And look, football's not played on paper, right? And that's why Brighton are one of the best. Um, and that's why... And that's why one of... And that's why one of... Um, sorry, I've completely lost my train of thought. That's why... I completely lost my train of thought. But football's not played on paper. And that's why Brighton have been able... Teams like Brighton have been able to do what they've been able, they've been able to do, right? With this whole money ball thing, right? So you can't really just look at names on a piece of paper and think they suck in comparison to this other team, right? Let I me mean, look at the Brian versus United game as a perfect example. But the squad is not... When you have a lot of people from an external perspective look at a manager like Ange and think, okay, he needs to have a very good squad to do well because his ceiling is very high. And when he has elite players, they can do really well. When you look at what he did at Celtic, in comparison to the rest of their league, the squad that they, that he had was elite in comparison to the rest of the league. So he was able to reach those ceilings, right? When you take it all the way back, the team that he had at Brisbane Raw, in comparison to the rest of the A-League, was very, very good in terms of talent on paper. So he was able to excel. He was able to reach his ceiling because he could get the best out of the best players in the competition. Same with Melbourne Victory. Yeah, he wasn't there for long, but he still did well. The Australia. In comparison to Asia, Australia, one of the better teams. So he was able to use the best players in that competition to excel. Yokohama, a little bit of a different story. He was able to completely rebuild them and created them into a very good squad, right? With a complete language barrier as well. So this is a very... And obviously, if you want to go back further at teams like South and in the old NSL, then the same principle applies. So I think people looked at the squad, looked at Harry Kane leaving, looked at Hugo Lloris leaving, looked at all this leadership leaving, looked at Ange Postecoglou, a very inexperienced manager, being thrown to the deep ends with players like Solomon, who have come from Fulham, Madison, who got relegated from um, Madison, who got relegated from Leicester, with Papa Sarr, who is a nobody in. in in elite footballing terms, Basuma, who was bad last season, a completely different back four, no, like I said, no Harry Kane, and we're like, okay, 
what's going to happen here. This is danger signs. But people underestimated just how... It's it's almost like pe- they, the squad is getting the best out of Ange and Ange is getting the best out of the squad. So it's this collaborative effort to push the club forward. And you can't help but... You can't help but like completely fall in love with the whole thing around Tottenham, right? And I hate it as a Chelsea supporter. Whenever Tottenham score, half my body hates me or half of my body wants to kill the other half of my body, right? Because... As an Australian, you can't help but fall in love with Ange, and you can't help but fall in, but, and, but you also, as a Chelsea supporter, you hate Spurs, right? You love to hate Spurs. So it's one of those things, right? But what I can say is this... Uh, what I can say is that this will continue, but there will be a period where Ange struggles. There will be a period where Ange struggles. And what the English media are going to do, they're going to jump on his back. They're going to jump on his back, you're not good enough, honeymoon period... No Kane's going to hurt you. You're going to get a couple of injuries. No squad depth. You're, you're out of your depth. You're, you've been ju- jumped in the deep end with no floaties, etc., etc., etc. But once again, managers don't realise that Ange Postacoglu does not give a fuck about anyone except him and his club. So he will fight back at all the journalists like he has done already and will continue going on his merry way. If the club back him in, He'll get through that tough period. If the club don't back him in and panic and, and be reactionary to the rest of the media, they might get rid of him. They might not back him, and eventually it could lead to a bad, a bad outcome. But that's not Ange's fault. That's the club's fault, and that is what everyone has been saying. If Ange Postecoglou is to fail at Tottenham, it's not because Ange failed at Tottenham. It's because Tottenham failed for Ange. That's that's the underlying fault. That's the underlying thing. Um, yeah, it, that's that's the underlying thing. I just, it, I, I could speak about Ange all day, but yeah, it's just, they just keep on keeping on. They just keep doing what they need to do every single week. What more can you say? What more can you say? Um, f- I want to speak on another player as well. I want to I speak on a, another player because I saw this tweet. And um, oh, I saw this tweet. I saw the post-game press conference that Pep Guardiola did. Um after their three-one win away at West Ham, which was a, a very good win in the in the kind of in the context of the season, um, they went one 0 down away from home against West Ham. We had a very good start to the year. Liverpool picked up points um, in the game prior or in the in the fixture prior in terms of the nine, the early game. They were playing midday. Went one 0 down, um, and just really needed to win to maintain that top spot. And they came back and won three-one. Beautiful stuff. And he was kicked off by a 46-minute goal by Jeremy Doku. And I want to speak on Jeremy Doku because Pep was raving about Jeremy Doku post-game. And I, it clocked in my head that I was like, oh, this is the winger that Pep thought Jack Grealish was going to be. And this is the winger that Pep has wanted ever since Leroy Sane left. Jeremy Doku is very good. Like, very, very good. And I don't know how he hasn't been picked up sooner by a big club. He has this innate ability to find and to to find that yard of space and to always time his next move to completely counteract the defender's next move. So he will find that gap. He will find the missed time tackle that the defender makes and skip past them. And I think it showed in his goal where he completely like was just able to dance past defenders and get a shot off and it went in. Right. I think that goal that we saw from Doku will be replicated a lot. He'll do that a lot. Maybe not in the same context, of course. Because I think the context of that goal is a little bit freaky, of course. Obviously, just starting the half, right? But I think the ability for him to find space in the final third, get the ball, make a decision quickly, and make the right decision, is something that we saw glimpses of, especially in international games for Belgium. We saw glimpses of when he was younger. Now that he's starting to come into his own, he's what, 21 years old, right? He'll be 22 at the end of the at the end of the season. We're starting to see a far more mature side of Jeremy Doku and the ability to find that gap and to find that ability to impact this a certain scenario is something that Jack Grealish has not been able to do for City. Jack Grealish is far more patient far more reluctant to take a risk, whereas Doku is just, give me the ball, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take a man, I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna make that I'm gonna make that pass through the lines, I'm gonna get that cross into the box. And if it comes off, it comes off. If it doesn't, it doesn't, right? He takes a lot more risks. And I think with this new system that Pep is trying to play, which is far more direct in attack, 
trying to get the ball to Haaland as soon as possible, having Doku, Bernardo Silva, Phil Foden running off him, I think we could see probably the end of Jack Grealish as a main footballer for City, in my opinion. Because he it's a completely different player, and it's a night and day difference between just how good Doku can be at certain things in comparison to Grealish, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's it, it, it's one of those things where it's like, it's one of those things where he started instead of Grealish on the left and was just, I mean, Grealish wasn't on the bench. Maybe Grealish is injured, but still, right? He, yeah, was just far too good, right? On the day, got the got the goal, had a, what, an 8.6 rating according to the mob. So he was able to influence the game in a, in a big way. Um, yeah, you, you can't really say a lot more than just how good he was in that, in that um in this in this game, I think he's gonna do a, do a lot a lot right for for um, Man City this season. He's gonna do a lot right for Man City. Um, he just we just got such an innate ability to do the right things at the right time. And look, he got an assist in his most recent game for Belgium as well. Played well in the two quarters of an hour. Um, obviously, a, an hour and a, an hour and fifteen minutes that he played against Fulham in the game before. So, a lot. Good for Jeremy Doku. I just want to speak about him because I was really impressed by his performance when I watched that game back and I watched the highlights back. So, yeah, really impressed by Doku. I've been on him for quite a while. Um, he's been on my radar for for a bit. Um, so good to see him finally get the plaudits in the the mainstream plaudits that he deserves. Because I think he should have been picked up a lot sooner. I really do think he should have been picked up a lot sooner. But there you go. Let's. I think that's a good transition into kind of the the themes of the season. And obviously, the international break has come and gone. Let's have a look at some stories that could potentially form in the Premier League season. Like, I think I think one of them is Newcastle. And Newcastle are really weird because they got that one new win against Brentford. They got that one new win against Brentford. It was it was a it was a pen by Wilson. They've had a baptism of fire to start the season. They swept past Villa before losing to to City, Liverpool, and Brighton. They beat Brentford. So, arguably, five of the tougher games in the Premier League season, they've already got them done, right? Their run now is Sheffield United, Burnley, West Ham, Palace, and Wolves. A couple of very winnable games. I think this next month will be a very, very kind of deciding month for Newcastle in the league because now Champions League football comes into, comes into play. The depth of the squad will now get tested. If they can take... If they can get three wins from their next five games and potentially sneak a draw as in, in one of the other games, I think we're going to finally see them get their season back on track and really push for European football. But once again, like I spoke about with United, football is not linear. So if Newcastle underperform this season, I don't think it's at the end of the world. I just think it'll be a learning curve. But I think it's going to be a very important month for Newcastle United. If they can get nine points from their next five Premier League games, potentially even 10 11 points for the next five Prem games they'll get their season back on track and then they can really make that charge for that first for that Europe for that European football again if they can back it up in the Champions League it'll be even better their group's really tough so I guess it'll be interesting to see but I guess it's just yeah one of those things um where we'll just have to wait and see that's my I love that saying it's one of those things hey I say it a lot um it's just one of those things but it just is one of those things where it's we have to wait and see um so yeah on, that's the Newcastle kind of thing Everton Everton what are Everton going to do are Everton going to get relegated are Everton going to rival Derby County in terms of being the worst Premier League team of all time I, I, I doubt it I do doubt it however Everton are bad like it, it surprises me how poor just objectively bad they've been like it the squad is not bad like this it's i'm shocked i'm in shock right because they lost one nil to arsenal which yeah not a bad result they didn't really do a whole lot with the game right but when you look at that squad pickford international ashley uh, pickford england's international ashley young really experienced defender who can provide a lot of leadership probably well past his prime at a whopping 38 years old but still Tarkowski is more than Premier League level. Braithwaite's a young kid who they're trying to blow through the team, obviously coming in from the Youth Academy. I think he is fine. Like, I think he's a fine footballer, right? I think he will develop into being a fine footballer. 
Mikalenko has a lot of upside. This midfield five that they played, Dan Juma, Adrissa Garnagay, Onana, Dekure, McNeil, that is, objectively speaking, mid-table Premier League level, in my opinion, at, that, at their best. At their best, those five players are 12th to 10th, maybe 10th to 14th. That is their level. Their level is not currently sitting second last on the ladder with, or third last on the ladder with one point from five games. They started Beto up front. Is that his name? I don't even know his name. I don't think I, I don't think he deserves me to know his name. Um, yeah, Beto up front, who was poor, but they've got Calvert-Lewin on the bench, who I think they should start. And then even still off the bench, they've got far more. They've got they've got some spark off the bench, right? What, it, she. Sean Dyche is meant to be good. Like, I don't know why... I don't know how they're falling into this trap. Or not falling into this trap, but I feel like they are... They, I feel like they have this mediocrity complex, which is hurting them. Because I think if they had gone out and got a manager that can play football, maybe they could Maybe they could have done something. Maybe Sean Dyche was the wrong appointment. Because I think this squad is better. This... This... The, like, the squad... The... the the squad that Sean Dyche has right now for Everton is far better than almost any squad that he had at Burnley. And yet, look at how overperformed Burnley played in comparison, in comparison to, like, overperformed. Like, yeah. The, Sean Dyche's current Everton team is better than any Burnley team that Sean Dyche had in his tenure. Yet, look at the difference in performance and look at the difference in output. It's strange. It's strange. Maybe the squad's almost too good for Sean Dyche. Maybe Sean Dyche can't get the best out of this squad and they need to get someone more progressive to play that risky football, to try and push up the push up the table and cement themselves back in that mid-table, mid-table spots. It's interesting. It's going to be really interesting to see how they develop and how they can potentially transform their season. They've got a big month ahead. Really big month ahead. Because they're in danger. They're in big danger of falling out of the... At like falling deep in a relegation battle. So their next month is Brentford away, Luton, Bournemouth, Liverpool, West Ham. Oh, that's Jesus. You need to win. Need to win that Luton game. Luton at home, need to win. Like a need to win. Liverpool, West Ham, Brentford, tough. Bournemouth, they could probably scrape a point, but that's about it. That is about it. Really interesting month for Everton. Really interesting month. Um, yeah, any other storylines that I could potentially come out of this so far, this first international break? Tottenham being good, we've touched on. Liverpool being title challengers, not really surprised in the slightest, to be honest. Um, they were, they've were they been very good for, for quite a while. Um, in, like, in my opinion, they've been very good. So, yeah, not really surprised by that in that sense. Um, Brighton obviously being good. West Ham being good surprised me. Villa's topsy-turvy start to the season has been interesting in terms of getting smacked by by Newcastle and Liverpool, but also smacking um, Everton, Burnley and Palace. So good on them. Brentford, very much a Brentford start to the season, beating the teams that they should. Drawing to, drawing to Bournemouth, losing to Newcastle, drawing to Tottenham, yeah, okay. Um, Forest being good, surprising United, obviously we touched on Chelsea, I'm not going to speak about Chelsea. I can't bother this stupid club. Stupid club. Bring us back to these times. Bring us back to the 98 fucking Europe Cup Winners' Cup. Um, Cup Winners' Cup? Yeah. European Cup Winners' Cup, 1998. Gianfranco Zola. Uh, God. Um, what a time. What a time. I was minus six years old. Awesome. Um, Bournemouth haven't won, a, haven't won so far, but they've got three draws and playing relatively good football. Obviously, they taught uh, taught Chelsea a lesson how to defend properly on the weekend, which was awesome. Um, spoke on Newcastle. Yeah, so overall, that's about it in terms of the storylines coming in from the Premier League season so far. If we're taking a look at a preview, obviously, Champions League football's back. So i am be very interested to see how that whole thing develops. Um, and what we get from the first week of fixtures, obviously, Europa League is back, as well as Conference League, which is awesome. Premier League, no early game for the Premier League. Wow. No early game and no Friday night game. A shit ton of Sunday night games, though, which is just the best. Um, yeah, shit ton of... Yeah, so we've got three... Wow, that's some really interesting time slots. Um, maybe because Champions League is back and all that good stuff. Um, 
Yeah, is this North London Derby? North London Derby. It's a North London, Andrew's first North London Derby. That's going to be very interesting. Um, but yeah, that is all, I think. So that is all for today's episode. Thank you all very much for watching another episode of the Two Footed Tackle podcast. Make sure you subscribe. I didn't chat, I didn't plug at the start. Um, yeah, subscribe to the Two Footed Tackle podcast. Like the podcast, follow, rate, all that good stuff. Like all the audio audio platforms as well. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. Socials, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, Two Footed Tackle podcast. And there is a link tray link in the bios of Twitter and Instagram for all your Two Footed Tackle podcasting needs. Um... What else is there to go through? Nothing else. Enjoy your week. Go calm. I might be very depressed or very happy this time next week, but we're not going to let sport dictate my mood because we don't we don't advocate for that on this podcast. But yes, thank you very much. See you guys next week. Stay well, stay safe. Goodbye.